Hello and welcome to a new edition of The Big Picture, the show where we try to take you beyond the news to understand the larger processes that drive it. This week, India marked the 70th year of the adoption of the Constitution. The Constitution is a remarkable document which has governed not only just how the state has functioned, but how society in India has shaped up. To discuss what the constitution represented, the underlying vision that drove the drafters, as well as its contemporary relevance, and whether the constitution today faces a challenge, I'm joined by a very distinguished guest. Madhav Khosla has just written what is going to turn out to be the definitive book on the Indian constitution. India's founding moment, the constitution of a most surprising democracy. He is a professor at Ashoka University of Political Science. He is a professor of law at Columbia University. And he is institutionally affiliated to Harvard as a junior fellow. Thank you so much, Madhav, for joining us. Thanks, Prashant. Great to be here. I want to begin with, the, with, with, with what is the subtitle of your book. Why do you call it the constitution of a most surprising democracy? What was surprising about this, the text that was adopted 70 years ago this week? I think the most surprising thing, Prashant, about it is that it's actually trying to create a democracy in a place where you think that democratic government can't exist. And so it's trying to make people actually citizens who don't have the requirements for citizenship. And so in that sense, it's a very surprising democracy because nobody looks at this place and thinks, gosh, can it be democratic? And a lot of us say that in the current sort of conversations in India's post-independent history. But the, the question I was interested in is, what were the founders thinking about? Why were the ingredients not in place in conventional wisdom for India to be a democracy? Because I think the broad understanding at the time across the world, for at least since the middle of the 19th century, but even before, was that if you don't have a place that is ethnically homogenous, that has a certain level of wealth, a certain level of literacy, that has a certain level of actually solidarity and civic reciprocity, it can't become a democracy. So you need a certain set of circumstances and conditions that can make democratic life possible. So India's diversity as well as, it develop, as, well as its development indicators, you are suggesting uh, made it a unique case. Absolutely, it made it a unique case. In fact, it is the first country where democracy is being instituted at, at once so suffrage is not gradually granted in a place that has all of these hostile conditions. What gave the drafters, the founders, the confidence to devise a text which could make society and state democratic when the ingredients were not in place? So this really was the question that I was puzzled by, right? I began writing it and thinking, what were they thinking, right? Because a lot of people at the time thought that they were just mad. And I think what gave them the confidence was believing that, look, how people behave is actually hugely contingent on the circumstances and the institutional environment that they are in. So what the British or what a lot of other people took to be essential features of Indian life were actually a consequence of colonial rule and were a consequence of very specific institutional choices. And so the point was that if you put people in a different institutional environment, they'll just behave differently. You know, one of the critiques of the constitution has been that this was a document by the elite, which did not take into account mass sentiments, perhaps, at that time. Right. Would you agree with that assessment? If it is true, was it a good thing? I mean, I, I think I think the point is both true and not true, depending on how it's asked. If the claim is that, look, these were people who imposed a constitution on people who didn't really consent to it, that's plainly untrue because the Constituent Assembly and India's leaders enjoyed extraordinary political and sociological legitimacy. Right. So this is not a situation where suddenly some group of people who don't belong to the place are drafting a constitution, as we saw in Japan, right, where actually in Japan, a constitution is a foreign imposition. In India, that's not the case. 
But is it the case that the people who drafted it, even though they enjoyed an um, extraordinary legitimacy, wanted to transform the people? Yes. It's a transformative document that wanted to, and people like Ambedkar and Nehru are radical critics of Indian society. And I think it's precisely their criticism that makes them revolutionary figures. You know, you argue in the book that there are three central features in a way which drove uh, this uh, vision of the constitution. One, and I'll deal with all three of them. The first was creating a rule of law based regime through the codification of laws. Would you like to explain that a little more? Yeah, I mean, I think, Prashant, the simplest way to think about that, right, is you're asking a group of people to speak a new language. How do you get them to do it? And one way you get them to do it is by actually elaborating upon and explicating the rules of grammar. And so if we look at the constitutional text and we think this is so long, why is it so long? The reason it's so long is a lot of its content in other societies could be assumed. But in the Indian case, they have to put it in because they have to actually explain and teach people the grammar. And so it's serving a kind of pedagogical purpose. And then you think it has succeeded to a certain extent in creating a new vocabulary? I think so. I think that obviously whether or not it succeeds or fails at any moment turns on whether elite political actors embrace that vocabulary, right? If you want new people to speak a language and you spread the rules of grammar, some people have to actually accept that, okay, we're going to try to follow the grammar, right? And certainly, I think that was a central feature of the Nehruvian state. I think Nehru's commitment to actually following the constitution, he's, he's often spoken about as being a great democrat, but he's also a great constitutionalist, right? And that it was central to actually spreading that ethos. The second feature that you speak about is a centralized state. Uh, could you take us back a little bit to... To the context, partition had just happened. Right. But India was also remarkably diverse. How did the founders reconcile the need for a centralized state uh, with accommodating diversity? I mean, I think it's precisely a certain kind of diversity that leads to a centralized state. Because the argument is that, look, Indians are spread all over. They are all ruled by different pockets, fiefdoms, caste groups, village panchayats, groups where authorities exercised in different ways. And one way to make people equal is to say, look, we are going to put you all under the same umbrella. And that's the that was the promise of the state. So the minute we think about the argument for a centralized state, we need to remember that the opposing view was the argument from society. And so it was a contest between state and society. And the argument was that if I want to rescue the individual, I want to I have to rescue him from the burdens and the pressures imposed by society and put him under a state. And we could argue today, for example, the challenges that we need to rescue the individual from the state. You know, that's very interesting because as you, as you, as you indicated, uh, when you think about a centralized state, you often start thinking intuitively about a centralized oppressive state. But in this case, the centralized state was the emancipatory project. Absolutely. The whole point was that, look, if, if there are people who are all ruled by different rulers, all ruled by different kinds of pressures, you just put them all under one type of uniform roof. That itself enables equality. That itself means we see each other differently because we now all have one source of authority. The third argument that you make is about individual rights and how the constitution uh, defined the primary unit as the individual. But this was happening in a context where primordial identities were very important, particularly religion and caste. How did the constitution reconcile that tension between group and individual identities? I mean, I think at the heart of it, Prashant, is the fact that for 40 years before India's constitutional founding, you see various attempts to navigate relations across communal lines, weightage, separate electorates, all kinds of representative means. And partition shows you the failure of that. Partition is a constitutional breakdown. It shows you how any attempt to frame the question through majority minority lenses is bound to fail. And so you're going to have to have a new model of representation where the central unit is the individual. You know, that's a good segue for me to talk about what's happening right now, because we are also seeing in some ways reassertion of group identities right. in, in a way which would not probably have pleased our constitution drafters. You wrote an essay in the Open magazine about uh, democracy and the constitution. 
Do you think they are in tension today and they are in conflict? I don't think they are in tension and in conflict because I think the people who are pushing back against the state or who are being critical, as well as the state itself, both sides are claiming the mantle of both democracy and constitutionalism. And on the state's argument, A, they think that they have been duly elected, which is true. And B, they think that they've passed these laws through the required processes. And so they've conformed to the constitution. From the other side, the argument is that, look, democracy is not just about voting. It's actually about the equal treatment of individuals. And constitutionalism is what enshrines that kind of moral vision. And so I think both sides are appealing to different conceptions of the constitution and of democracy, but democracy and constitutionalism are not in, con in conflict. And, the, and uh, the founding vision I describe in the book is precisely an attempt where the constitution is a way to work out what democracy is. Are you concerned uh, that recent decisions of the government, particularly uh, since Narendra Modi came back for the second time, uh, in the context of Kashmir and the passage of the Citizenship Amendment Act undermines some of the founding ideals of the constitution? Certainly. I think above all, they undermine the ideal of treating people as equal, individual, free citizens. I think that part of the ultimate ambition of the constitution is to treat everybody as an equal and free being, regardless of identity, regardless of any kind of other social, communal bond or pressure. And I think that that's, that's hard. It's hard to achieve. And I think, I think that that is a real challenge today. So are we then seeing the beginning of the unraveling of the constitutional framework as it was envisaged and maybe the rewriting uh, both explicitly and implicitly of the norms that govern the constitution? I think potentially so. And I think that part of the story of the Indian founding isn't only a story that that's actually what freedom requires but that's actually what makes for a politically sustainable society. And you might be seeing a challenge to both of those things. So if this process continues, you are arguing that even political coherence of so so coherence in society as well as the political sustainability of the state will come under stress? I think so, because I think part of the argument here is the argument that, look, in order for actually a self-sustaining politics to exist, you're going to have to have everybody buy into the project in some way. And the only reason why people will buy into the project is if you give, the only reason why if you, is, will depend on whether you can give them a good argument for staying committed to the constitution, right? For staying committed to that. And that would have to treat them as free and equal beings in some way. Otherwise, people exit, right? And one of the great I think strengths of Indian constitutionalism over the last 70 years has been that it has actually minimized extra constitutional conflicts. There have been very few and that might begin to change. Let me end with a question. You've been working on the constitution for over a decade now. You've written other books on the constitution. Uh, what does it make you feel like when you see protesters today who are dissenting peacefully against the state, against legislations, read out the preamble? own the constitution. Is this a moment that, uh, you know, of, of, of ordinary citizens owning a text that so many people had just thought of as abstract and ir people didn't even understand how it related to their lives? This ownership of the constitution at the level of the citizen, how does it make you feel personally and what do you think it means politically and symbolically? I mean, I think I have sort of two contradictory thoughts on it, right? On the one hand, I think it's wonderful that the constitution has acquired a kind of life in India's public and social existence. On the other hand, I think it also reveals that people have had to turn to it. In part, in the past, they've not had to because they've not needed to. It's doing its work in the background, right? And sometimes the most relevant things are things that, you know, Rousseau has a great line where he says the achievement of political leaders is that of great political leaders is they make a country feel that it doesn't need leadership. And so we now suddenly feel that we actually need to recover the constitution. But it, 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 is, it is worrying, but it's also heartening. I think so. I think so. Thank yeah. you so much, Madhav, for joining us. Please join us for the next edition of The Big Picture next week.